This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Hi, right, guys. Today, we've got a special guest on the podcast. His name is Scott Box, and Scott is the author of a book called Heroic Disgrace, A Worship Hero Story. So this book goes into a, a lot about kind of mental health struggles. And so um, there's a lot of through points of this book. There's examples of great fathering and kind of how he created a hero figure out of his own father, his personal obsession with kind of the overall concept of being a hero, how that kind of led to some dissonance in his relationship with Christ and kind of how that works within Christianity. Then he kind of descended into some mental health struggles and he finally got a diagnosis, but he was working in ministry at the time. And if you're dealing with mental health struggles, you can't really show that if you're working in ministry and people don't really know how to talk to you and they just look at you like you're crazy. And guys, we get into all of that in this book, so I'm not going to keep him from you any longer. So without further ado, let's get into it. Scott Box, welcome to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Hey, Kyle. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to being with you. Yeah, I will say that off air, you asked me if I lived on the West Coast, which is maybe the most offensive thing that you could have asked a guy from Oklahoma because it's like, I don't sound like that. I don't live in that area of the world. I don't want to live in that area in the world. How do you live there? Dude, I was born here. That is the only, only reason. And and I met the hottest chick I've ever met in my life here. And her family lives here. So. Well, I've got news for you. Now, there's been a break in technology where they've made these things called airplanes where two people, regardless of how hot they are, they can get on them and they can fly to anywhere on the planet and yeah. then they can stick their flag in the ground and yeah. stay there. Just, you know, just letting I, you know. I, I, I appreciate that, man. Hey, I, I will say that, you know, this this area needs some of us studly dudes to hang out and, and go to battle here because my word. Nah. No, nope. let let the bears take out all the liberals and let all the conservatives hang out oh here gosh. in the middle of flyover country. But we need to get into the real business for today because we're getting Let's into a it. book that you wrote called Heroic Disgrace, A Worship Hero Story. Now, um, very, very early in the book, you tell a story that was very interesting about the heroism of your father. And it seems like, like you and your dad have a very, very special relationship. So how about you tell us a little bit about that story and then tee up kind of the 30,000 foot view briefly of what the book is about? Yeah, you bet. So dad and I, uh, I'll, I'll spoil the ending. Dad dies in the end. <laughs> and yeah, it happens. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that, that really was powerful for me with my journey with my father was this, this it, it really wasn't unspoken, but it, it was this, this ever, this constant thing with heroism that we were we were wrestling with in our lives and uh i wanted to be a hero and my, the the problem that i had is i wanted to be the hero just like my dad was the hero uh and i realized for a long time that or it took me a long time to get to that place where i wasn't designed to be tom box i'm scott box and Tom Box had his own stuff he had to deal with. He had to, his own things he had to conquer. Uh, but that was a very hard thing for me to deal with. And then to tee you up for the rest of the conversation, I suppose, is that this has to do with my descent, if you will, into mental illness and my struggle to find the heroism that I, to achieve the heroism that I thought I was put here on earth to achieve but ultimately i i was just clobbering together a heroic frankenstein rather than jesus christ's way of heroism well we'll get we'll get to all that stuff here later on in the book because that is really kind of the hinge point of everything that you do i do want to spend a little more time focusing because you know your audience is mainly fathers that you're going to be talking about and just there was there were certain times in your dad's life where he could have zigged but he zagged and zagging was the exact thing that he needed to do so there was a, a story of you kind of standing up for a girl that you liked i think you were in elementary school or maybe junior high uh, and you yeah. ended up punching a kid i want to read this this quote from the book and then get a little bit more feedback from you on it sure 
Sure. When I turned and walked out of the bedroom, I was a free man and restored conf- with restored confidence. Instantly, I was again much more like the all-American, God-fearing kid who picked a fight with a bully to save a princess rather than the violent, pathetic, emasculated boy I believed myself to be since 3.30 p.m. the prior afternoon. Maybe I was wrong to meet violence with violence in protecting the girl I had a crush on, but my dad treated me as if I was in the right. I had been the hero, and he was proud of me. What a gift my dad gave me. Now, the the emasculated feeling you got was from all of the effeminate people that were at your school, that basically any form of violence for any reason whatsoever is terrible and bad, and you're probably going to go to prison and get raped. Like, that. that's just kind of the idea. But then, like, your dad went a very, very different route, and he, he filled you with something that you were able to carry into your adulthood. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. Boy, that that is an enormously powerful gift that my dad gave me to to – to remind me that I could protect myself. I know, uh, look, uh, so many of us grow up in families where, A, we don't get that in the first place, or we get some twisted form of it where we're supposed to kick everybody's butt and, and we don't treat our women right. And, you know, uh, anyway, there's, dad modeled a, dad modeled a masculinity that was, uh, was pretty healthy in the end. And yes, when you say effeminate, you know, that this is one of the this is one of the worst things about living in the Northwest that I've realized guys like you didn't have as as difficult a uh, a, a ladder to climb in regards to, in my opinion, in regards to the the whole um, p- uh, political correctness crap that I've had to I was overwhelmed with as a young, young person in on the West coast and especially in the Northwest in Seattle, I I've had to climb out of that. And to this day, I struggle with saying things that I mean, but always second guessing myself. My dad helped me slowly unpack that. So though that was a tension on one side, I was getting smashed in the public schools and all of that. And on the other hand, I had my dad going, no, 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 it's okay to be a butt kicker. <laughs> well, and that's, that's the thing that I think is very important because, you know, I definitely encourage everyone to take people, take their kids out of the government schools. They're not public schools they're government schools. And, yes. you know, if you want to do homeschooling, that's great. Some, that's not really an option for a lot of people. So doing some sort of a private school or other ways to educate your children, because the math doesn't add up because your dad may have an impact on you, but the timing doesn't work out. Cause if your kid is at getting ready for school in the morning at school by eight, you know, stays at school until three and then at home, he's got to do homework. How much time are you really spending with your kid? You can't make up for it on a Saturday or on a vacation once a year. And so you need to have these moments that that you leave out for them. But before we move off the subject of your dad, even though he is a through point for the entire book, there there's a somewhat lengthy quote that I want to read because this was during the challenger disaster. So anyone that's kind of in your age range kind of understood what it was like being a, being a kid and seeing the challenger disaster take place on television. So I'm going to read this quote to you because it was another great, great thing that your dad did for you. So here's the quote. While teachers all around the country had turned off the televisions to protect school children from the confusion and fear of the Challenger disaster, my dad called me from work to tell me precisely the opposite, to watch and pay attention when others were looking away. Dad didn't want me to close my eyes when I had the opportunity to learn something about honor, dignity, or patriotism. He wanted to teach me I might have to make the same sacrifice someday. Dad wanted me to know where uh, know there was a life on the other side of death, not to fear death. Yeah. To be watchful, listen, be courageous, take action, and fall asleep every night with a peaceful mind with my dignity intact. This principle was one of the greatest gifts my dad had ever gave me. It was his way of teaching me I had to pay attention or I had to be paying attention to know when to dive in and help others. If I was aware and looking, I could be one of those who bolted in when others were jumping out. I could be one of those who lived with my uh, lived my life by principle, not by emotion. And so there were there were a couple other things in there, you know, basically talking about emotions. But then he kind of ended with this with with a statement that really stayed with you in, into your adulthood, which is the boxes are hosses. So if anybody missed your name, your last name is Box. And so when he says the boxes are hosses, that left an indelible impression. So how he responded to the Challenger disaster and how he required you to respond, and then the boxes are hosses. Give us a little bit more on that. Yeah. You remember that day, don't you? I don't. I was a little too young. Were so you uh, young? okay. Yeah. Okay. So because what what year would that have been? And I was trying to remember before 86. before I, I think it was Yeah. 86. So that I was born in eighty six. So for me to remember it would be uh, would be pretty tough. No, gotcha. So I that 
you, the way that you say it, though, those who were alive remember that day, you know, right. alive and, and old enough. But I was 10 years old. And yeah, I, I for whatever reason, I was homesick. And I remember that phone call from my dad. And I, of course, I didn't know what they were doing at school. I wasn't there. But I later on and since since then, over the years, I've realized just how many people turned the freaking TV off. <laughs> the teachers were just horrified that they they allowed children to see something that, you know, represented the real world. Are you kidding? <laughs> and so I, I didn't know that until later. In the meantime, my dad's like, hey, you got to you got to have eyes on eyes on this ears, ears open so that we can talk about this and we can pray about this. And this was the chest thumping patriotic stuff that I, I was born into in my family, which I, I really do appreciate. Uh, as far as the boxes or hosses, this wasn't a real negative thing uh, at the beginning. Hoss rep is the, the name as even people older than way older than us would know this Haas was a character in, in an old Western uh, TV show. And he was a stud. He was a butt kicking stud who would come to anybody's aid. A Haas was somebody who was really a hero. And uh, the boxes were heroes was basically what my family was saying. Uh, us boxes are hosses. We come through always and if we don't we've got to try harder <laughs> and mm. so so whatever that did to me mentally there was a tweak it wasn't a bad thing and I'm not saying being a hero is a bad thing but what I do where, where we do need to get to eventually and you can guide on this but we need to get to the place where my understanding of heroism or hossism <laughs> was was completely different and upside down from Jesus Christ's m method of heroism. And there, there you go. Yeah. So there was, there was actually a quote later on in the book, and then we'll get into some of the mental health stuff. And the quote was, I never imagined, nor was I effectively taught that I'd need Jesus to make me an actual hero. Right. So th something that struck me very early in the book and kind of carried through for me is why that would be your desire because some people would call that you know here that would they would call that a complex to where you have these people that yeah. try to force themselves into heroic situations yeah. when they're not prepared for it not mentally yeah. not physically and then you have people that just respond to you know these crazy circumstances right. to become a hero and so it's like it's like these people that are obsessed with becoming a hero they yeah. almost always become a joker instead and yeah. so it's almost this disordered notion of this even being a goal. And also it, it comes right. to this very self-centered view of what Christianity is, that somehow Christianity is about us, that somehow the Bible is about us when nothing could be further from the truth. I've mentioned this several times on my show, but uh, Stephen Furtick, who is one of my least favorite pastors in existence right now, he invited <laughs> one of my favorite pastors in existence, Matt Chandler, to come speak at his church years and years and years ago. And Matt Chandler came in there and just wrecked shop. He basically was talking about really? David and Goliath. And he's like, you're not David. If you're reading the Bible and you think you're David, that you're the point, you've got it wrong. Right. God is about God. God is not about you. God is not about, you know, sure. your innermost thoughts and feelings and making sure you feel good. He's about his glory. And right. if you are on the wrong side of his judgment, it's not going to be good for you. So talk to me a little bit more about that because this whole time I'm like, why is this guy just uh, obsessed with being a hero? What is, yeah. what is the positive outcome of that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, here's, 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 I don't know if this is another perspective on it, but I do know that, that there's an aspect to what Christ has done that is supposed to include us. This is the trippy thing of, of heroism. And this is why, let me start with this worship for me. I, there was a guy in Seattle who was a really good musician and in church language, a worship leader. So for me, uh, he was a good singer. He was a great guitarist. And he would stand up on platform every single week and lead music. And I wanted to be that guy. That guy, his name was Mark. Mark was, Mark was, he was a badass. Like Mark, I wanted that. And so for me to, to want that, 
that was whatever worship was, that was it. And so recognizing that that kind of worship is where I was headed, I then was like, okay, well, then if that's heroism, being on platform, people cheering for you, whatever, then I, sign me up. Okay, so on the other hand, there's this thing that where, where I've recognized that because I've been a Christian my whole life, I've realized that Jesus's type of heroism hasn't been the type. Here, in fact, let me read this to you just to get us on the right track. The irony is the great hero, Jesus Christ, his, his disgraceful method for saving humanity was the way to his heroic victory and crown. So in, in other words, Jesus modeled, what Jesus modeled was humility, not pride, submission, not strength. Slavery, not mastery. Being the least, not the greatest. Being the last in line, not the first in line. Hang with me. He was selfless, not selfish. He propped up the weak and the broken. Jesus came, as we know, to serve, not be served. And he gave himself away, not to demand his own way. That inverted everything. And then that's when I go, well, that if that's heroism, I better figure my stuff out so that I can be that kind of hero. And that's the, that's the thing is as much as the Bible is about Jesus, it is about us. He, we were called to rule with him in the garden. And in the same way, we're called to be like Christ. (laughs) It's impossible. How can we do it? But we must be like Christ. We must love like him. We must serve like him. We must be heroic like him. Is it a complex? Yeah. It is. Well, it's, I guess for me, it's the overwhelming focus on self because in our modern, and you know, with, with pastors yeah. basically doing Ted talks with Bible verses sprinkled on top, you know, these worship <laughs> pastors who have no theological understanding of what they're singing, you know, singing to Jesus as if he's this, you know, fair haired, light featured guy that they can just cuddle right. up with and kiss on the nose whenever they, right. whenever they're feeling boyfriend sad Jesus. or something like that. Boyfriend right. Jesus it's you know, we, we've gotten this really, really awkward sense of what, what our relationship is is to Christ and what our relationship is to God, not relationship with what our relationship is, where we stand in the cosmos. Because when we read the Bible, we have been taught by these terrible pastors that read it as if you're the person in the story. And it's like, no, 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 no. God's Mm. trying to teach you something about you. You are not the point. And by teaching something about you, he's showing you something about himself. Why does he give us something like marriage? Because that is the closest thing we can understand to the sacrifice of Jesus for his bride, the church. Like it's the only way we even get close. And what this all kind of seems like it works towards, Scott, is this this sense of calling and this desire or complex towards heroism or something like that. It led to stuff that you were talking about early in the show, which is this struggles with mental health. And you were eventually diagnosed with bipolar two. I didn't even know there were uh, multiple ones. I didn't know there was a sequel to bipolar one and then something called hypomania, which I wasn't familiar with. So talk a little bit about that kind of your descent into some mental health struggles and then eventually being diagnosed. Sure. So, the, the bipolar journey or the descent into that really did hinge in a lot of ways from uh, some, whatever it was that was wrecking me, I did not know. Carrie Ann, my wife and I got married when I was 22 and she was 20. And we, I, I, I dipped into all sorts of self-medication stuff at that point in time. I don't know if it was stress. I don't know if it was just sickness, you know, the, the slow descent into whatever bipolar is on the front end of things, but hypomania, hypomania is both a, a blessing and a curse. We hear a ton about depression, you know, and we have for years and years, uh, you in for by with bipolar, you dip down into depression, but the silver lining with bipolar disorder is you also go up into mania or hypomania mania sucks full-blown mania it's this crazy overlap of agitation irritation impulsivity that will just destroy relationships destroy your life uh you can be uh, yeah it's it's destructive but there's this glorious place that can last for minutes hours days called hypomania 
And that's when I'm the most creative. That's when I've been the most mentally sharp. At least I thought I was. Uh, hypomania, I call, I call it hypomania land. It's a lot like getting to Disneyland as a kid or Christmas morning as a kid and just wanting to stay there. Uh, so bipolar disorder for me was diagnosed. I, I really was, I struggled between ages 25 and 30 and then finally was diagnosed at age 30 and then went on that whole journey with counselors and doctors to try to figure out how to medicate myself. And by the way, I've not been afraid of medication. Once I knew or had a name for what was wrong with me, that there was, there was an answer. There was a, there were strategies we could use and medication we could take. I was all in. So uh, that's one thing I wanted to talk about. And I want to leave a little bit on the bone here. So, so guys have a need, like if this is interesting to you, you, you got to get the book. We don't want to get into all the details, give away all your secrets, but you, you do detail a lot of kind of those different things. But I, I remember at one point uh, in the book, it was probably around the middle where you were talking about, I don't know if you use this word, but you became dependent on medication. Uh, it The way you described it almost reminded me of you made an idol of medication. Like once I find the right cocktail, I will have solved the issue. I will, you know, we've got a diagnosis now, so let's get our cocktail going. And I guess my struggle is I just did a, a debate uh, uh, just a, a little while ago. By the time this comes out, it will have been a, a long while ago. We're right. the most medicated society on the planet. Right. We take more SSRIs and more antidepressants and more mind-altering drugs than the rest of the world. Like it, it is an astonishing amount. And yet we still have this meaning crisis in the West and especially in the United States. We have all these issues that come out of these mental problems that people have and that we almost create. Right. And so part of me is like, I know people that are close to me that they, they have, you know, a three or four minute conversation with a doctor and all of a sudden they give them, you know, an orange, you know, yeah. bottle with a white cap and here's some yeah. Zoloft as if, oh, it's not going to be a big deal. Let's just take this for six months and pretend like we know what it's going to do on the back end. Yeah. And then once that doesn't work the same, they're chasing the next drug or the next drug or the next cocktail or whoops, that cocktail, you know, hurt my liver or it hurt my brain or I've lost my personality. And it's like, I don't ever hear doctors prescribing 60 days of hard exercise and clean eating. Right. Because at one point you, you said you blew up, like you, you got super fat. Like you talk about that yep. in the book and you know what that did and it affected you. So part of me was, I really struggled with your discussion of medication in your book because I was like, man, everybody goes down this route and they all seemingly end up in the same place. Like if you've got something acute, like, Hey, you have an infection, you have to take this for the next seven days or you will die. Right. That makes sense to me, but totally. hey, take these mind altering drugs for an ill defined or non defined period of time, and then we'll just see where it goes on the back end. I really struggle with that. So, so give me a little bit more on it because I am a little bit ignorant. Yeah, you bet. Well, I think that exactly what you uh, described is what happened to me when prior to diagnosis, if you will, proper diagnosis, and that's that's a really important distinction uh, we need to make is that I went to see my general practice doctor and what did he do? Sure enough, he threw antidepressants at me <laughs> and without a proper diagnosis, antidepressants for somebody who's bipolar will actually trigger mania. And it, it triggers, it puts you into a really hellish place. He did that. <laughs> he did that to me. And and it was misery with a proper diagnosis. And this is, this is where we do need to separate to, when, when somebody is actually, or has a mental chemical imbalance. So the, what we're dealing with in, in my case is a actual chemical imbalance in the brain that needs to be righted. If you can get the right cocktail of medication, then you can balance out. It's like putting a sling on your arm or, or putting a bandage on your arm. If you've got it now, that's a bad analogy because the sling or the bandage can go away. It, the chemicals, I need those, me those medications to stay balanced chemically. So I'm all in on that as opposed to somebody. And this is where it's different. Somebody's feeling depressed. Uh, Doctors will just throw depression medication at them or, you know, something to help with anxiety or, I mean, right. that is bad. That's what well, Scott, 
Yeah, go well, ahead. Let me, no, I, I appreciate it, but I, I want to stay on the stay on this trail. I'm, I'm with you. Like, it's super bad because used to people could just be melancholy for a period. But when's okay. the last time you heard melancholy when it wasn't in the context of an old Smashing Pumpkins album? Like, no one really knows, like, what <laughs> melancholy right. is anymore because sometimes you just, you're, you have this lull of energy and this lull of place in your life, and it's an introspective time that you should probably spend in prayer. But I guess these people, like, like what you just said, it's like, I need this to keep the chemical balance in my brain. Well, there's quite a bit of data and research about people that they go the the diet and exercise route and that is that is what they do that is their medication and so i think medication for a lot of people becomes an easy button you know it's not it's not right. easy again i'm painting with a broad brush here guys don't send me any emails that, because you're angry but it's just like it seems like it's let's find the easy button because we're americans and if we're fat we want a pill to make us not fat if we're lazy we want a pill to make us not lazy if we're whatever like that that's kind of where i struggle to where it's so, like so, none so of those people cool. compare it Let's go down that route then as yeah. far as what I experienced, because then I also got this experience of losing my voice to yeah. the point like I, I actually I had to get cut on. I actually had to go get surgery. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was in speech therapy of all things right. as a grown man. I'm in speech therapy and yeah. my speech therapist looks at me and goes, you, you're not going to get better. You're right on that line of losing what you thought you had or would have the rest of your life. And if you don't fix it now, it's gone. And then her line to me was, and I have no problem sharing this. Her line yeah. was bring your, bring your running shoes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And dude, this was my speech therapist telling me this. Right. And so we ran, she ran me on the Hills of Portland uh, for the next dozen meetings, appointments, I went and she ran my fat butt up and down those hills in order to prove to me what needed to happen wasn't chemical or wasn't, you know, even vocal. It was, mm -hmm. it had to do with my body. That, that right there is such a great testament to the entire, the whole, the, 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 the mind, the body and the spirit being, having to be connected. My mind was starting to get locked in and realized that a lot of this was happening at the same time for me. There was overlap in all of this chaos in my life. And I had to get myself together and I was doing it. I was trusting the professionals on the medical side, on all of it, including the, the mind and the body, which had to do with my, my vocal cord stuff, but she was kicking my butt, <laughs> getting me in shape. And then the spirit side, I was working with my pastors who really, frankly, were a lot of, a lot of them were behind the eight ball on this stuff. They didn't understand. They didn't understand, nor did they really care because I was the crazy guy. I was the crazy guy. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? They, they didn't understand. Like what part did they, did they a quite lot of understand? Pastors, well, church, and this is, this is not condemnation. This is a, a critique of the church as I experienced it. People, they don't know what to do with somebody that has a mental diagnosis. Uh, that it's, and I appreciate the fact that the folks that I got to work with did love our family through the season that we were in, but they didn't know how to handle it, how to talk, what questions to ask, to do things like you and I are doing, to mm -hmm. dig in. Let's talk about medication. Let's talk about, you know, the, the other sides of <laughs> trying to get healthy. You know, let's talk about getting yourself out there and doing some freaking push-ups, for goodness sakes. <laughs> so I actually did want to talk to you about that, about struggling with mental health and kind of going on that journey while working in ministry, because you yeah. see a lot of people, especially jaded people that use hashtag X evangelical. Now it's like, yeah, I used to be a pastor and then I read some woke dude's book and then I changed my entire worldview right. because my worldview was never strong to begin with or something like right. that. But in ministry, you're a professional Christian, right? And that is different. You can't have a bad day. You can't have the sads. You can't be angry. You can't, you know, respond to something negatively. If you have to ask for forgiveness from somebody else, it's like double sin. Whereas for all of us other normal Christians, it's just single <laughs> sin. It's a single serving of sin. And so I guess what was that like being in ministry and like really kind of having to walk through all that, you know, I guess a side to or in addition to, you know, people not quite understanding how to talk to you about it. Yeah, boy, I, I love the fact that you bring that up, Kyle, because the truth of the matter is that when you're, <laughs> and I, I say this with tongue in cheek, but when you're the crazy one in the room, 
there's a whole lot more freedom to to ask for forgiveness. There, I, 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 this is this is one of the greatest blessings of of my bipolar disorder. I, I, I say this all the time, but this is the, the the blessing of my bipolar. The miracle of my bipolar disorder is it it forced me to reach the freaking end of myself. I and and in that I didn't care. I don't care what you think of me. <laughs> I don't care what pastor down the street thinks of me. I don't even care. I, and this is hard, but I don't care what the pastor I'm working for care thinks of me. I want him to be honored by the work that I do, but I no, no longer am. My identity is not locked into the fact that he thinks I say all the right things, or I am marching the exact same march that he's marching. I want and need somebody to, to love me and appreciate what I bring to the table, period. And that doesn't mean that I'm not willing to learn. That doesn't mean that I'm not willing to grow, but that has offered me an enormous amount of freedom in ministry to be Scott Box. It's a big deal. So I do want to get back to the ministry thing, but to kind of put a bow in the book again, the name of the book is Heroic Disgrace. It will be in the show notes. Uh, the foreword was written uh, by your cousin, who just so happens to be the guitarist of one of the biggest rock bands of all time, Corn. so Brian Head Welch. Um, and he said this in the foreword, and, and I kind of keyed in on it. So let me read this quote here. There are many forms of mental sickness, but I believe a massive identity crisis is one of the biggest causes of this depression-induced dark cloud over much of humanity. Undeniably, more and more people are starting to wake up and realize that chasing the wrong things in life does not work. I believe the antidote is found through discovery. Discovering our identities in Jesus Christ develops a strong character we need to handle the pressures of life. I believe Jesus is the first step in combating the plague of depression and hopelessness. And so... Um, I've talked to people before and, you know, if you know anything about Brian's story, obviously just what most guys deal with whenever they're in a rock band like that, lots of drugs, lots of booze, lots of women, lots of depression, lots of darkness, suicide, the the whole nine yards, like he's got that in his story and he's talked about that openly and, you know, he's, he's, you know, become a very outspoken Christian and, and all that. And he's been, he's been a great thing uh, for, for the cause of Christ. And what he talks about there is the exact right thing. And so when you look at, you know, when you look out on culture and you see something like gun violence or, or mass shootings or school shootings or something like that, it's like, okay, we automatically want to focus on the instrument that was used in the evil, as opposed to where did that evil come from to begin with? And when you live in a secular culture, you can't talk about evil because secularism doesn't give you categories for that yeah. because secularism can't tell you the difference between good and evil and what it's based on right. because they can't put it in a Bunsen burner or in a beaker and figure out what it means in a lab. They can't even explain what love is to you. They say, Oh, I love my wife. I'm like, okay, explain that to, to me only using science. They can't do it. They have to get into <laughs> philosophical. They have to get into all these other different areas. And so I guess my question is, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to ask after that quote, so I just kind of sure. left it up to my no, imagination. I guess <laughs> in our society, we over-medicate, we over-medicate people, and we underspread the gospel. We we over-prescribe, uh, hey, you need this you need this counseling group, which is going to take you through 12 steps. It's a secular group, but every now and then the, the main guy will quote scripture, so I guess it's kind of Christian, as opposed to just talking specifically about the Bible. And so I agree with Brian that this is an identity issue, and it's because we're finding our identity in our medication or in our favorite sports team or in our, you know, high school on a particular video game or how many times we, you yeah. know, win our fantasy football league, but that, that doesn't lead to a positive outcome for people. So go. Yeah. So here's what D Brian has blown my mind with. And I'll just give you this one word and then we yeah. all unpack it. The one word is witness. Yeah. Witness mm -hmm. where we have failed as men, especially has been in our witness. And when, when, and I'm sp I'm speaking specifically to Christian men. And there's things that I know in my life that have taken me out in the same way they took Brian out, not in the rock star way, but yeah. pornography. I, I mean, talk about shame and I mean the guilt and shame that blew I, mean, I it that type of self-medication was horrific to my witness. Now, there's for me, this, this idea of becoming somebody who recognizes that need to, let me back up just a smidge and say yeah. that as a worship leader, what wasn't working for me was leading people in effeminate singing 
on sa- Sunday mornings, even uh, the boyfriend, the soft little ballad songs to Jesus, trying to rustle up the emotions. And as good as emotion can be, it is not action. And what we've found is that in the church, as a worship leader, I wasn't changing people's lives. I wasn't I wasn't guiding people into a witness. I was just leading them in sync song time. <clears throat> and keep in mind, that's not bad. The, 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 the connection of all of the voices of the church is uniting and it's, it's healthy, but it is incomplete. If worship does not lead to a witness, it is right on the verge of worthless. And mm. this is what Brian did for me is that Brian modeled a witness that was mind blowing to me. As a worship leader, I could not look at Brian's life and go, I, I recognize that. I, that's I, His worship yeah. was different than mine, and his worship was connected to his witness. This is what changed my life. Brian, Brian was the rock star. I was the worship leader. The rock star led the worship leader, and that's not tongue-in-cheek. That is a real thing that happened. I think that's an incredible thing. I I can't remember how you worded it. I forgot to put it in my notes, but it was something along the lines of Brian told you that if you, if you have something that's worth spreading, you have to spread it all the time. Or do you, do you remember exactly how you worded it? Because you were talking about how Mm. he was just constantly witnessing to people. So he, he himself had a witness of his life, but it was how he was witnessing to people. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't remember the quote exactly, but it it has to do with, uh, you know, he was so in love. He couldn't just not. Yeah, I mean, it was a, that sound. That's right. It was, negative, but. but it was like it was it was overflowing. It was it's like overflowing. he couldn't not talk about it, and that's right. the thing that I that I struggle with personally. And I forget who said it first, but it's like look at how people respond when their favorite team hits a home run or scores Come a touchdown on. or gets a <laughs> yeah. knockout versus when somebody says, I accept Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And I know all the Calvinists out there is like, you can't do that. God did it for you. There's no such thing as free will. We're not getting into that right now. But no. like, no, we, right. we, it's kind of this. It's just like this. Oh, isn't that sweet? Yeah. Oh, little Johnny got yeah, baptized. Tip, tip oh, hat. that that's great. Oh, yeah. if I have time, I'll go up to him after service and tell him how proud I am of him. Ooh, but I want to make sure I get in line at Golden Corral so I can get the best, you know, right. piece of whatever. And so, like, right. we don't have this overwhelming desire to spread the gospel. Some people think it's because we're scared. It's like, no, it's because a lot of us don't actually believe it. Because if you actually believe it you would scream about it from the rooftops. But I I do want to kind of transition again. Thank you so much for sending me this book and sending it out to me. But you've teed it up a couple of times, so we have to go into it a little bit deeper. Episode 176 of my podcast, we're in the 300s now. So why do I remember that that one particular episode? It's because I'm asked about it constantly. The episode is called Contemporary Christian Music is for Women and Effeminate Men. And so Nice. Whenever yeah. it took me 176 episodes, I think I promised on episode like three or four that I was going to do an entire episode just about contemporary Christian music. But I go into the massive problems with it, and you know you've ta- you've touched on it, the lyrical content. I you know whenever I was talking about the lack of any theological basis, and as a man, you know if you are a man that is a little bit stunted in your emotional understanding, even of yourself, you're going to sit there with your hands in your pockets, and you're going to be like man, what are all these people doing with their hands in the air? Like, I just don't get it. And it's because they're singing to Jesus like he's their boyfriend. It's homoerotic. They they don't really understand. Right. And so like, talk to me a little bit about that because you've led that, but you're also kind of leading a rebellion to that. And and also manipulation is a word that I want to use. I don't think you used the word a second ago. You, You were just talking about emotion. But when you do bridge, 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 chorus, bridge again, another chorus, let's do the chorus again. And there's 17 people on stage, only four of the mics are actually turned on, but they're dancing and they're hooting and hollering and they're whatever and they're whatever. And if you don't feel that way, you think, man, am I a Christian? I had a local worship leader here in my community say, Kyle, I'm not sure you're saved because you don't like contemporary Christian music. And he meant it and he meant it. And so talk to me a little bit about that because you've kind of been on both sides of this issue. Kyle, you're going to hell, first of all. And, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Dang it. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> and second of all, I uh, I think you're right. I think that this is, we have found ourselves in one of the most unhealthy places as a church that we could be in regard to worship. Because worship means singing and song time. And that is, that is retarded. That is absolutely behind. And that is, that is completely we have lost our way 
when our worship is not connected to our witness, we are in big, big trouble. Here's the thing. What I've found is that we must, our, our witness, and here's, here's where this witness, I, I got to double back to what we were talking about. And I, I'm realize we're up against some time stuff here, but uh, I want to be very clear that witness for me has to be connected to my pain. The reason I am so, I'm so dialed in on what this, what my work is and in talking to you, Kyle, is that I know that my bipolar disorder and my wrestling with heroism and worship, this is part of my pain. This is how I wrestled with God. And he punched me in the freaking growing and dislocated my hip. I will walk with a limp the rest of my life, but it will remind me of my purpose which is to witness, which is to tell my story through my pain. That is my worship. Jesus modeled that kind of worship. Yes, pastors have told me, well, Jesus sang a hymn. Yes, Jesus sang, we know of one hymn. Right before he went to obey his father to go to the cross. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The night he went to Gethsemane and Peter kicked, you know, cut somebody's ear off. These guys were bad A's. They, they understood what it took to, to worship and to worship with their life. And they did it with their pain and they were driven. They were driven to live the model that Jesus had. Here's the thing. Jesus modeled a type of worship that we don't seem to understand anymore. It, yeah. Jesus modeled a reverence to the father. It, it, Jesus, Jesus submitted himself to the father. This is amazing if we could submit ourselves to Jesus the way he submitted himself to the Father, that then I say is, that's masculine worship. That's, if, anyway, keep going. No, 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 Scott, reverence is the key word because we look at godliness and we look at Christianity as something that we can squeeze in our schedule. So someone said this to me recently, I don't know if it was, uh, if it was in an interview or if they just said it to me randomly. They said, right. it's not how many years you've been a Christian, it's how many hours. And that's the thing that a lot of us are like, oh, I became a Christian when I was 12 and I'm 32 now. So I've been a Christian for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. But but how many hours have you been a Christian? How often have you been digging into the book, digging into prayer, spending some time listening to God, being reverent of who he is? And that's where I think we we get it wrong is we talk about the nice God. That's why I talk about the Lamb of God. That's why I have a, you know, that's why I talk about the Lion of Judah. That's why I have a lion over my shoulders because this overemphasis on the Lamb of God to the detriment of the Lion of Judah gives you an incomplete view of who, of who Christ is. And yeah. so when you need the Lion of Judah and you don't know how to call on him, that becomes a little bit of an issue for you. But we'll, we'll make this last question of the day because you, sure. you have sure. some experience in this. But what would you say to any worship pastors out there or lead pastors that have mm. direct leadership over a worship pastor in terms of how they can turn things around? Because after that episode, I had a worship pastor reach out to me. He's like, Kyle, you know what? I, I've never considered the lyrical content of the songs that I chose for Sundays and what the men would think, because I challenged these guys. I was like, look out on the crowd and see what the men are doing. you know, cause you know, maybe you're not a real handsy church or maybe you are, but just see, like if you see men with their hands in their pockets, maybe identify one and go up to that guy after service and just be like, Hey man, I I don't want to put you on blast. I just wanted to ask you, you know, personally, I didn't really see you getting into it. Like, can you give me a little bit more behind that? Like explain that to me, but you've probably got some good advice for people that, you know, have the microphone in the earpiece and, you know, uh, just tell them what they should do to make it a better experience. A more, a more impactful or a more real experience, not just more exciting or more emotional. Yeah, no, we don't need more of that. We don't need more lights and, and stage fog. Yeah. You know, we, we don't need more of that. Um, I, my, my, man, you're a good interviewer, man. This is good stuff it, because we need, the church needs these kinds of conversations. Here's what I won't do. What I won't do is pretend like I've got it all figured out. My, but I do, I, I've led music at a cowboy church for seven, eight years. And you have to understand rural America uh, doesn't even function like they, I have less leeway among the men of rural America than mm-hmm. I did in suburban America. Yeah. And uh, my recognition being on platform has been that I need to call men out by name, like not, not personally, 
but I need to expect them to participate. And so for, for, for me, the expectation is you're here, you're going to sing. It's not, it's not about if I've done my job and I've picked the right songs and I've done, you know, my job is to call these men into being vocal participants. And if I can do that, then that's, that's a big win for a Sunday morning. But if I cannot guide them then into taking that singing to a witness, I have failed. And so I don't know the answer completely, but the win has to be connected to the witness. And so again, singing, I have to call men into singing and using their voice. And I have to call them into a witness. If we can do that as worship pastors, I think that we will have changed the church in an amazing way and left worship in a better place for the next generation than it was left to us. All right. I think that's a great place to leave it for today. We've gone everywhere in this conversation. Again, thank you for the book. Thank you for sending all that my way and thank you for your time, but that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Uh, I so appreciate you. Thank you for your audience. I hope that this is inspiring to them and uh, look forward to another chat with you down the road. All right, Scott Box, thank you for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Thanks, Kyle. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with Scott Box. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost at Undaunted Life. Our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got two links for you today. I've got a link to the book where you can go and pick it up, Heroic Disgrace, A Worship Hero Story. And also I've got a link to a Christian Post article that he wrote years ago called My Battle with Bipolar Disorder, God Makes Healthy What He Doesn't Heal. I thought that was a very interesting perspective. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, Keep pushing back darkness. Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah. Judah.